Hello everybody, this is I think episode four of my 10 minutes at two creative writing class right this way. I thought today we would cover the basics of description. This isn't meant to be an exhaustive list, but I thought it would just help you think through what you're doing with description when you're putting it into your short story or your novel, whatever it is. So a description has a number of jobs to do. So let's run through what those could be. Again, this is an exhaustive list. You might come up with others and please put those in the comments if you want to add to the discussion. Um, so the first job that a description does, which I'm sure you're all aware of, is the idea of world building. Now, you are no doubt familiar with this from fantasy novels where they're trying to persuade you to believe in a world which is being created. Um, but it also is building worlds within our world. So thinking through some famous examples of this, the one that immediately leapt to mind was uh, Bleak House, which has a really famous beginning um, about fog. So I'll just read you a little tiny bit from this because in fact the description, if I hold this up, goes on for quite a, quite a long way. Um, fog everywhere. Fog up the river where it flows among green eights and meadows. Fog down the river where it rolls defiled among the tears of shipping and the waterside pollutions of the great and dirty city. And so on. It keeps going, it keeps going, um, describing where all the fog is. And finally, it says, and hard, and hard by the temple bar in Lincoln's Inn Hall, at the very heart of the fog, sits the Lord High Chancellor in his High Court of Chancery. And then we realise that this fog has been an extended metaphor for the problems that the law makes for people in the world of Dickens' novel. So it's done a very clever job of setting up the theme of the book, as well as evoking that classic Dickensian landscape of the urban city with the gas lights and the poor people shivering in doorways, you know, that, that stuff which you immediately think when you think Dickens. So that's description doing a sort of world building idea. Right, so it also can be used in a more complicated stylistic way, not that that was simple, um, to say something about the style of the book, the philosophy of the book, something about time. Um, so this is easier to understand when you think about examples. I thought about To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Um, it's a stream of consciousness novel, which means it tries to explain the world as seen from our interior perception. So the description has a sort of interiorness. Um, but there is a central section which changes that. It's a bit like a, a change in chord or a, a, something shifts and you get the passage of time told through description. So there's this rather, it becomes almost like poetry. Uh, anyway, I'll read you a little bit. So with the lamps all put out, the moon sunk, and a thin rain drumming on the roof, a downpouring of immense darkness began. Nothing, it seemed, could survive the flood, the profusion of darkness which, creeping in at the keyholes and crevices, stole around window blinds, came into bedrooms, swallowed up here a jug and a basin, there a bowl of red and ye yellow dahlias, there the sharp edges and firm bulk of a chest of drawers, and so on. And it's sort of like an erasure passing over the middle section of the book. Um, and if you want to understand more about the sort of Virginia Woolf approach to description, I think it's a very good idea to read a bit more about her. I've got an excellent biography of her. I think the writer is Hermione Lee. Check it out. Uh, but it explains what's going on there. Um, in Virginia Woolf's world, but just in our basic class here, we're thinking about how description can move you on from one place to another, but not only in terms of physical location, but stylistically pacing and also grappling with the reality of living in time. Yeah, deep stuff. OK, so that's Virginia Woolf. But then there's something else um, that description can do. And this is what I want to focus on really for most of this little 
10 minutes. And that is using your description as a point of view experience so that you're also developing your character through your description. So if you're thinking about a first person narrative, then clearly that is how it's going to be because you describe the landscape from the point of view of that character. But it also is very present in what you would call a close third person. So when you have the events told through the eyes of a character, uh, the simplest in sort of kids literature is to think of Harry Potter, where you see everything from Harry's point of view. But obviously it's a, a thing you find in a lot of um, adult fiction too. Um, and what's going on is it means that you've got very efficient description because not only are you evoking a world, but you're also telling us how the character lives in that world. And so you understand more about the character. And the book I chose to show this is a, a mo fairly modern novel called All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Durr. Um, wonderful book, highly recommended to put on your reading list. And what I particularly like about this is that the main girl character in it, um, Marie Laure, is well, she's a French girl living through the war, but she also is blind. So her interactions with the world are through non-sighted experiences, um, which of course makes you as a reader experience the world as she experiences it. It broadens your understanding of what it's like to live like that in a wartime uh, environment and so on. So um, I, I won't read too much of this, just a little quote to give you a sense. Um, Uh, she runs her fingers over the model in the kitchen, counting miniature benches, trees, lampposts, doorways. Every day some new de detail emerges. Each storm drain, park bench and hydrant in the model has its counterpart in the real world. So what we've got there is um, the father has made his daughter a miniature version of her world and she's feeling it so that when she goes outside the door, she has more independence. And that in a way is a beautiful little microcosm of what the book is doing. It's a miniature world, which we're feeling our way around to understand and negotiate. Clever. So uh, how do I use description? Well, I think hopefully I've used it in all of those ways, obviously not at the same high level, but I try. Um, and one book where I, used it in its world building function which is huge fun is uh, in a book called dragonfly which is a really personal favorite of mine um, and in dragonfly i created a culture which was run by women i wanted to see what a matriarchy would be like so it's a very formal culture so the descriptions in this set up this in what i think is a fairly unique culture because we don't see many of those in world history but I extrapolated from things that I had read about. So the descriptions world build, but also when my main character Tashi moves to another place, I'm able to show how unfamiliar it is to her by her reactions to that other place. And so you learn about her as well as this world, um, that you, this new country that she moves to. So that's what I was thinking as I did that. Uh, so homework. I promised I'd always leave you a little bit of homework. Homework today is to, it's very simple, is to find a picture that you can explore these ideas around. So I'm just picking at random a postcard that I use in creative writing classes. Uh, this postcard is a sort of odd picture of a lady sitting on a park bench. As you can see, she is appropriately socially isolated. And she, um, could be your hero, heroine, uh, or she might be someone that your main character sees. So in order to make this work as a passage of description, if there's a scene being set in this park, what I would do now uh, is I'd think, well, who is my point of view? So let's say I'm not that person, but I'm looking at her. Maybe I've come to meet, it's a spy novel, okay? So I've come to the park to meet someone, I'm looking around for my contact. So there are three things that I want to talk about here when I describe. The rule of three is 
fairly good guide. Victorians did use the rule of about 100, but modern novels tend to go for three. Um, so I would pick out three things that my character would be looking at. So he's looking or she is looking for her contact. She would notice the straight lines of the tree. So she might be comparing it to something from her home. So if she was, say, Russian, she might think about the Russian steppes or a place in Moscow, you know, something which connects to her background. Uh, and then maybe I would evoke something about the the smells and the scents. I feel it's in France. There, it's in France, isn't it? So I might evoke some things which try not to go for the cliches, you know, baguettes and coffee, but I might try and think of something that I associate with Paris. Uh, cigarette smoke, um, what else do I associate with Paris? Food is 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 up there, isn't it? But music, sound, sense, um, probably I'd go to Paris and with my notebook and make a note of these things, but I can't go today, so I have to imagine. Anyway, so I pick three things and then I'd work up a passage of description, a scene where the character comes in looking for her contact and I'd put those three things in to evoke the sense of this deserted park with this key meeting happening. So the rule of three. So your homework is to go away and find um, a picture that you would like to world build around and have a go at picking out three elements that will reveal not only the place but also the character interacting with that place. So simple, isn't it? Anyway, I hope you're uh, all doing well and uh, I'll do another of these short sessions tomorrow at two o'clock. So hope some of you will join me then. You can always catch up on YouTube or on Facebook if you miss the two o'clock. Thanks very much. Bye.